All right, everybody, I want to welcome you to another Thursday. See, these weeks just seem to roll by so quickly, but we do these each Thursday night at seven o'clock central conversations with Commodores and the gentleman who is my guest tonight. I've been looking forward to getting him on the show for months. One of the two most requested guests we've ever had, former trainer in the 80s during the Watson Brown era, now the longtime Pittsburgh Steelers head trainer, of course. John Norwig. John, thank you for joining me this evening. Well, Bernard, it's my pleasure. And uh, I have many fond memories of my time in Nashville. And not only with uh, Watson Brown, but uh, I started out with George McIntyre and then Watson. And then uh, um, all the gentlemen from Colorado after who, um, who uh, am I thinking of? That's right, Denardo. Yeah, Denardo. Jerry Denardo. Well, well, John, I know that you, your educate, formal education was at Penn State, and then you went, I think your first major training uh, job was at Penn State before you came to Vanderbilt, but what brought you, how did you end up coming south? How did you end up coming to Vanderbilt and, and working there for uh, five, six years? Well, that's going to take about, I don't know how much time we have, but it'll probably take about half an hour to get through all the details. But uh, in 1984, I had the opportunity to work for the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, I went there when I was, uh, I was working and teaching at Penn State at the time. And uh, I had many students ask me what life in the NFL was like. And I had a uh, classmate of mine who was an assistant with the uh, 49ers, John Miller. And the head athletic trainer at that time was a guy named Lindsey McLean. And I'd never really met Lindsay, but Lindsay uh, is a Vanderbilt alum. Lindsay is uh, um, a Hall of Famer in uh, my athletic training realm. It's called the National Athletic Trainers Association. And Lindsay was involved in hiring uh, the two prior athletic trainers at Vanderbilt. Dan Campbell uh, came, was there just before me. And then before Dan Campbell, there was a guy named Jack Redgren. And uh, uh, Lindsay had a role in getting them to Vanderbilt. He had uh, a role in getting me there. Um, uh, a real quick story is I was uh, uh, working football camp at Penn State. Uh, I was an assistant athletic trainer there. And when I went home, remember it was old time then, I, we're talking 35 years ago, uh, I had a phone call. And this is Roy Kramer from Vanderbilt University. That's who called me. And uh, I'm thinking Roy Kramer from Vanderbilt University, and I don't want to offend anybody. But when I was working at Penn State, I'm a Northerner. I'm in State College, Pennsylvania. And I'm thinking, where is Vanderbilt University? Well, you know, you couldn't go on the Internet and look at that time. So you use these things called blue books. And I, got, I went to the college blue book, and I looked it up. And I thought, holy cow, Vanderbilt University is in the Southeastern Conference. And they play. LSU, they play Florida, they play, uh, you know, Tennessee, all, all these, these powerhouses. And um, I, I guess I should have been more aware of what was going on. But then I, I met with Coach Kramer and I had the opportunity to work at Vanderbilt, which was uh, a great opportunity for me and one of your other former uh, uh, guests, Brad Bates. And uh, it was it was wonderful for both of us. Well, well, John, you also, at that time, was it also a factor that Emily, your wife, was from Nashville? Was that part of the equation at that time? Oh, oh no. I, I didn't know a soul. I, I didn't know one person when I moved to Nashville. So um, I think I was 27 or 28 years old. I was the youngest uh, head athletic trainer in the Southeastern Conference. So Lindsey McLean, Coach Kramer, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, George McIntyre for accepting me. Um, you know, I have to thank those guys. I, I'm where I am today. If it wouldn't be for people like that, I wouldn't be here where I am today. Well, well, speaking on behalf of, of the athletes who were there at, at, during your tenure, we're, we're glad you, you were there. And we, we're so uh, proud of all that you've done uh, since then. But John, before we keep going, a whole bunch of Commodores have rolled through that say hello to you. Uh, Coach Gary Shepard is apparently taking a little break from the steak restaurant 
tonight. He is uh, tuning in. I remember yeah. Coach. Uh, Louis Woolridge from out in Cal uh, California says to tell you hello. Well, Louis Woolridge came through Pittsburgh uh, about two winters ago before COVID, I think it was, and I didn't have the opportunity to meet him. He came to a game, but I, I don't think our paths cross. I don't That's know why he was in Pittsburgh, but he was around. Well, he he came specifically to see you, John. You just blew him off. But that's no, I did not. No, uh, Tyler Chastain, who was a manager back during the same time I was there, says yep. to you hello. Patrick Fitch uh, says hello. O.J. Fleming, who was a couple of years behind me, and Tom Gray sends his regards. Yeah, uh, I remember Tom Gray. Tom Gray remembers getting. Uh, hit during, I think it was either a PAT or a um, uh, field goal attempt, and he was concussed. He, <laughs> that, we handled that a little differently than you handle those today. He didn't know where he was or what was happening, and he was. Uh, I sat beside him on the plane going back to uh, Nashville from Tuscaloosa, and I think it took all the way back to Nashville before he started to realize what was going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm going to get to that protocol in just, just a second, John. I, I, I don't know what folks call you nickname-wise now, but every one of them back in the day and now are calling you Wig. Do folks still call you Wig? Yep, they sure do. Everybody at uh, your work. And in fact, Dwayne Jones, remember Dwayne, who was the head sure. manager under Kelly and Luke at the time, says to tell you hello. Yep, I remember his mom real well, and I remember the Gaines brothers. Oh, yeah, and, and in fact... Chris is going to be my guest in a few, well, in several weeks from now in August. Really looking forward to getting to talk to Chris as, as well. John, what was it about the college game that attracted you to first Penn State and then you stayed in, in the uh, college ranks for another several years at Vanderbilt before heading into the pros? What was it about the college game that you enjoyed being a, a trainer? Well, I don't know that, uh, Bernard, my aspirations – out of, of uh, Penn State as an undergrad, I thought that if I had the opportunity to be an athletic trainer and, and be the, have the opportunity to teach, and I, I never dreamed of being at a, a big Division I school initially. I dreamed of being at, you know, a, a Division II or even a Division Three school starting out. And um, so I was at my alma mater. When I went back to my alma mater, I went back there to uh, after I was working at a high school and I went back to um, Penn State because there was an opening with the men's basketball program. And luckily enough that the uh, administrators uh, and the head athletic trainer at Penn State thought enough of me to give me that opportunity. And so I was teaching at Penn State and I was uh, working with men, predominantly men's basketball, but I worked with football a little bit. I worked with, there were some female sports that I worked with. Uh, track and field, cross country, um, men's lacrosse. There was a bunch of sports that I worked. So, uh, but I didn't have aspirations of, of, of when I was graduating from college and thinking that I would have the opportunity right away. And then to come to Vanderbilt and, uh, you know, have that opportunity. It was, I'm glad I was by myself. I'm glad that, uh, because it, it, it was a big transition for me. I, I, that's a, that's a big time school. Well, I, I was going to say, you, you, after spending most of your, I guess, formative years or your first, in your 20s, your, your late teens into your mid 20s in at Penn State and then coming south and you're not even 30. And you, as you said, you were a single man, no family yet at the time. That transition, I bet that probably took a little bit of time for you to get adjusted, but what was that like for you the first year or two? Well, that's why Vanderbilt was special. You know, that even though it was part of the Southeastern Conference, mm -hmm. uh, our athletic department was not all that large. Mm -hmm. And the people there were good people. Uh, Bill Kelly was, you know, accepting. Uh, Joe Warden was there. He's a longtime athletic trainer at, at Vanderbilt. Uh, welcomed me with open arms. And... Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the gal that was there, uh, Shirley Simmons. And uh, they, they were, they welcomed me. And um, the players were real accepting. You know, they didn't know me. They didn't know me from a rock in the mud. Uh, but um, 
all the players at Vanderbilt, and, and maybe it was because of the perception is that you come from uh, a big time Division One school. Mm -hmm. Heck, I could have worked intramurals at Penn State. People wouldn't have known it. They didn't know really what I did, yeah. but um, I had that opportunity. And then uh, as time went on, when I hired some people, I hired people that I was familiar with, and you know, with with Brad Bates, especially Brad Bates and myself. You know, we were brand new there, so we were learning together. Because I think Brad was an assistant at Colorado before he came there, and. Um, we just had we just had a good very good relationship. I had the utmost respect for him. He's still one of the best strength coaches that I've ever worked with. I know that he went on and had a, a career as an athletic director at a couple of schools, and and I think he was in charge of um, oh I don't know what you would call it uh, higher education or academics. He's an academic advisor or something to the athletic department. But uh, you know he he's a unique person, and, and all you guys if there's if there are Commodores on this uh, podcast, you guys were lucky to have him as a, uh, a person that you could, um, he's a good role model, you know? He's a very good role model. Had some crazy ideas, or at least uh, we thought that they were crazy. Do you remember us pushing the cars up the parking deck on Valentine's Day, the Valentine's Day massacre, and all the competitions he had everybody doing? Yeah, but think about that. I, that's just being creative. Yeah. Because he was get, he was getting results from that kind of thing, and he kept it interesting, and he made it fun. We we had a, a lot of fun. Well, I was going to say you guys may have had a lot of fun, but us it was a little bit of torture. But no, it was fun overall. You're right. Yeah. Being creative takes away from the mundane, and you 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 get things done. And you don't really even realize you that you've done them because you're so engaged. But John, you also you mentioned it a minute ago. You hired some very quality staff who've gone on to have some great careers. Tim Bream was in the pros. I don't know Tim's whereabouts these days, but I know he's with the Bears for many years. Paul Federici was, I think, at the University of Iowa. You could probably expand a little better, but those two men were also during my tenure in the late 80s under you. Well, Tim was a longtime athletic trainer. He went to Richmond, and then he went to the Bears as an assistant and was the uh, head athletic trainer at the Bears for many years. And then he had the opportunity to go back to Penn State, and he was uh, their uh, coordinator of sports medicine. He was a football athletic trainer. And uh, he now uh, – he, he was in that um, – I don't know if it's called the American Alliance of Football, but one of those minor league football programs. Mm -hmm. And when that folded, uh, Tim's now in Florida working as an athletic trainer. And Fed did more than uh, – just go to Iowa. Fed was the head trainer at uh, for the Seattle Seahawks after he left Vanderbilt, and I think he was uh, with Seattle for double digit years, more than ten years, before he went to uh, Iowa and he was the head athletic trainer uh, at Iowa for a long time, and is now an administrator of some type. I think he might be, um, you know, work with Kurt Ferentz and and do some kind of uh, administrative thing with football, but he's. Uh, probably an associate or an assistant AD of some type there now. Well, it's, it's what, what kind of blows my mind thinking back at when we were as undergraduates, we were 18 to 21, 20 <laughs> years of age. You were what, about 10 years older than us. <laughs> Ed and, and Tim Bream were only a couple of years older than, than us. And I'll tell you, John, one of the things that I think you, you instilled equal amounts of respect, fear, and friendship amongst the players because of the way you dealt with the players. You knew, this is my observation, you knew when to be serious when the time was serious. If the injury or the pain or whatever it was were called for it. But when you saw somebody who was um, wanting to get out of practice or was not uh, really being on the up and up, you didn't have a problem calling that out. And that, <laughs> that right there to me was the number one thing that gave you, in my opinion, the most credibility in the training room, which I think is very, very important for you to have that sense of credibility. But your sense of humor back then, I don't know how it is now, hadn't been around you in a long, long time, but I suspect it's the same. 
your sense of humor kept everybody engaged. And that was, those are some of my fond memories. I had a lot of fun, you know, um, I'll tell you one really good story uh, about Vanderbilt is that um, when I came there, Will Wolford, you know, he was called the tractor. You weren't there then. He and was that, was George Mac he was, that was George McIntyre. And yeah. I didn't realize how good Will was. I, you know, Will was a damn good player, but we overall, we were not very good. Mm -hmm. And um, I got to know Will, and uh, I, I wasn't that much older than Will. I mean, he might have been 22 probably or 23, and I was 27 or something. Mm -hmm. And I got his wife, Jude. And I know he used to go over there to the cooker. I don't know if the cooker still exists. You remember the cooker? That was a restaurant right oh, across yeah. the street. No, I think it's changed names a few times. Yeah, it probably has. But his wife, Jude, used to work there because he would get frustrated with uh, food services because you guys used to eat in the, the dorms at that time. I forget the name of that cafeteria up in the dorms. If you somebody can remind me of that. But Will wouldn't eat there, and he'd go over where his wife was working at the cooker, and he'd pay the lowest price at she would be his waitress, pay the lowest price, and that son of a gun would get free meals all the time. But to see Will and see him, you know, that was a big deal. I think he was, you know, a top 10 picker. I know he's a first-round pick for, for Buffalo, and he played in four Super Bowls, and I followed his career, and then he went to Indianapolis, and, and I can remember they were scared to death, death at Indianapolis because he tore his rotator cuff, and they were concerned about how to treat him and they're calling me. And I said, I haven't been around Will in a number of years, but I know he did real well. He had uh, that rotator cuff and then he ended up with us. And, and he's, uh, after being with us, I still stay in touch with him. He's probably the guy that, a player that I stay in touch with more than anybody. And uh, he's been such a, had such a successful career and he's, he's doing great in retirement. And uh, I can't say enough about him. I remember, uh, Mark Ratcher really well because my first year he dislocated his hip and uh, he was our quarterback. He dislocated his hip in, uh, against Kansas. Well, hell, that doesn't happen very often. I, in fact, I can think of my 30 years with the Steelers since I've never seen a dislocated hip. Now, it happens occasionally, but I, I can remember we had this fancy new uh, uh, stretcher device. I don't even know what the hell it was called now, but the wheel fell off in front of 50,000 people at, uh, in Kansas because Dr. Lipscomb couldn't get his hip back on in the field. And that, that's a hard joint to reduce, but he couldn't reduce his hip in the field. He had to go back and put him in the emergency room and make him sleepy. So he would relax and reduce his hip. But Ratcher, uh, uh, that was a bad injury. And then I think Gromos got the chance after him and you played with John Gromos. I, did. I think he came in after that. And Gromos was a good quarterback. I, I really think if, if he'd have had the opportunity or had somebody to protect him, I think perhaps he would have got a shot to play in the NFL. As it, as it was, John, I think either signed free agent or was drafted very late, maybe by the Steelers and, and did, didn't make the cut. But I think you're right. We switched offenses a few times. Watson was just trying to figure out what would work offensively. John sat for a couple of years and came back his senior year to, to play a lot. But um, I was going to ask you or comment that Mark Ratcher was about as tough of a guy at that position as I had ever seen. Ugh. You may or may not remember, we went to Tuscaloosa or Birmingham. I think it was Tuscaloosa the next year, the fall of 86. That was my freshman year. Ratcher was slated to be the starter. And he got hit by either Cornelius Bennett or, or uh, Derek Thomas on almost every single play. No offense to Mike McDonald, Casper, but that was our left tackle that day trying to defend against those two Hall of Famers. And Ratcher must have been sacked, I don't know, every other play. But it was it was pretty brutal. But Mark Ratcher, he was a tough, a tough oh, dude. No question. We had a lot of guys that were tough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John, we've got uh, Dwayne says it was Branscombe dorm is where you probably the dorm where you were thinking about where we ate cafeteria. Yeah, it was Branscombe. That's right. Kevin Dowling says to tell you hello. Joe Peebles says to tell you hello. Great. Guys, we're talking with John Norwig. Of course, John's been with the Steelers for 30 plus years. He's in the Pennsylvania uh, Hall of Fame for athletic trainers. He was the NFL trainer of the year 
several years ago. I could go on and on and on, but I know he doesn't want me to about that. But I want to talk about your dynamics of working with Coach McIntyre's staff for that one year, and then Watson, a whole new staff coming in the next year, and then you had Donardo for your final year. Vastly different personalities, but how did you deal with, with each? You have to remember, when you come from – first of all, I was never a head athletic trainer before. So when I first came to uh, Vanderbilt, I tried to do my job, but I, I couldn't find my way around uh, Magoogan Hall at that time. So I was that was a whole learning experience. And, and Coach McIntyre was, was good to me. I, if, if we had any issues um, as far as – injuries and I, I don't know that I do it any differently now than I did uh, at Vanderbilt is you just communicate with everyone and and, and let uh, coaches know who is available and do the best job you can um, and the assistant coaches at that time I mean they were they were good to me and and uh, the guy that I leaned on the most and 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 uh, worked with the most again was Brad because of Brad, it was it was an easy an easier transition. Mm -hmm. I mean, but if I had to, as far as with coaching staffs with with that particular coaching staff, um, you know, I just tried to be a good communicator and try to work hard and do a good job, and that's mm -hmm. wasn't that hard. They were good people. We just yeah. didn't win many games. I don't think we won a, a one game. We won uh, Boo Mitchell or not Boo Mitchell? Who was our uh, Crawford? Was our running back? Our, our um, my first year there, and, and we beat uh, uh, UT Chattanooga like six to three or something like that. And that's the only game we won my first yeah. year at Vanderbilt. There were a couple of years in there. We just had one one Wednesday. <laughs> Wig Fred Peterson says to tell you hello. Yeah. And, and Noel Wells said to tell you hello. He also said, if you remember, did you? I assumed you flew with the team for those out of state games. Oh you were yeah. Flight going to Kansas. Oh, yeah. And the team playing almost had a bad outcome. They almost had a bad outcome when we were landing. You could look out your window and see the runway. You're not supposed to do that when we're landing. It's turned sideways. And we had to land, and I think we went to Kansas and landed in a bus to Manhattan. Uh, is that Manhattan, Kansas? Is that where? Uh, no, that's, that's Kansas State. Kansas State. But we bus to wherever Kansas is. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I, that's one thing I, that was the year before I came. So I never had that. Unfortunately. Well, and you remember planes back at that time, they filled every seat. I mean, it's not like we flew. Right. Uh, the greatest planes and that, that type of thing. Yeah. We landed in Kansas and had to, to bus to uh, the university of Kansas. John share with us a little bit about your transition from the college game to the professional game. It's, it's, it to me, not knowing, it would seem like it's completely night and day, but the principles I assume stayed the same. But share with us a little bit about that. Well, I think you're right. I think the principles, it's football. And, and uh, you know, uh, to have, uh, again, that was almost like Mr. Kramer when I got a call and where's Vanderbilt? Um, when I had the opportunity to go to the Steelers, I'd always talk to Brad and I'd say, Brad, you know, I wonder what it's like to work in the NFL. Would you work in the NFL? And, you know, we would go back and forth like that. And he's like, God, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, the only reason that I had the opportunity to go, well, there's a couple of reasons, but one of the reasons that I had the opportunity to go to um, the uh, NFL is because when we had scouts come in, even though we had some players at Vanderbilt that were pretty good and, and we'd get scouted like every other school, but I would, prepare something where, and probably with HIPAA today, you as an attorney would tell me I couldn't do this, but I would put Bernard Nomberg. These are the injuries he's had while he's at uh, the, uh, with, with the Vanderbilt Commodores. And uh, he does well in the training room. He, he's a, uh, a good student. And I did that with every senior and I would give a packet to a scout when they came through and I became familiar with the guy from uh, the Steelers. His uh, name was um, Tom Donahoe. And uh, 
he would always talk to me because he knew I was from Penn State. Uh, he knew that uh, you know, I was from Pennsylvania. So he, he would spend time with me and he was the, the uh, college roommate of a guy named uh, Tim, um, what is Tim's last name? Um, well, he was a, a college roommate with the head trainer at Tennessee, mm -hmm. Tim Carey, Tim Karen, Tim Karen was his name. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when, when the Steelers were hiring uh, an athletic trainer, I think uh, Tom Donna, who became the head man or the uh, general manager, but I think he asked Tim Karen to be the head trainer. Now, Tim would never admit this, but Tim said that, that he should interview me. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like with Roy Kramer, I got a call out of the blue one spring uh, in May. And uh, this is Tom Donahoe with the Steelers. Uh, and I said, yeah, you, you need some information on our rising seniors. You know, I thought he was calling about uh, players for next year. He said, no, I want to talk to you. He says, how would you like to interview, be the head trainer for the Pittsburgh Steelers? And I almost dropped the phone, you know. So yeah. what an opportunity. And, and what a change in my life that was to have this opportunity. Oh. But as far as the game, it's still football. Um, there's a, a different set of rules. And the first thing I noticed when I came to the NFL is the speed of the game had changed. Mm -hmm. Because even though I worked in the Southeastern Conference and there were some damn good players we had in the Southeastern Conference, mm -hmm. uh, the speed of the game was just uh, so much different uh, in the NFL because this is the best of the best. I mean, it, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, a first round draft pick or you're a free agent. You were probably pretty good in your college or you wouldn't be here. Right. And uh, even the free agents, you know, come with some accolades they were all conference somewhere they were captain of their team or, or they wouldn't have that opportunity in the NFL so it's the best of the best against the best of the best and um, it's a different dynamic where when somebody got hurt at Vanderbilt we made sure the coaching staff knew we made sure the family was involved we tried to get them the best care possible uh, the other component in the NFL is now we have to deal with agents and and agents are connected many times with, with their own healthcare providers. So there's a lot of second opinions. And, um, you know, uh, we work with those athletes and, and try to get their confidence. And, and I, I have many, many people that have gone through the Steelers, both that have lasted, uh, you know, a year or two, or just been through training camp, or I've been here for a long time. And um, they're football players, they're people, they're you know, some of them are pampered SOBs that uh, have been enabled since they were, you know, 14 years old because they were such good athletes. Mm -hmm. But uh, overall, I can tell you that um, the Steelers have been good. Uh, the personnel people, the scouting department at the Steelers have been good because uh, they generally get people in that you can work with and communicate. and. Uh, you know, the, di the difference, one of the differences between Vanderbilt and the NFL is people went to Vanderbilt for the most part to get a degree. Mm -hmm. People went there to learn. People uh, were going to be educated and they were going to get a degree from, you know, we laugh about it, I guess, and you guys may still talk about it, but I always tell the people that come from the SEC, I was from the Harvard of the South. You may be from Alabama or Georgia or Kentucky or wherever. But I worked at Vanderbilt. I said, we, we got degrees. We were the bosses of the people that graduated from your school. Uh, uh, so right. that's, that, that's how I can relate Vanderbilt to, to uh, Najee Harris. Uh, um, so um, it's, uh, it's different. And it, people get paid, like, paid a lot of money to do this. I was going to say, John, with the with the, the Steelers organization having only three head coaches in what fifty years, <laughs> for a long time. That, clearly, this franchise has figured out a formula. And as many times as they've won the Super Bowl and attended the Super Bowl, but whatever the formula is, they figured it out. But here's my question, and and, and you really got to tell us the truth here. You've been there for over thirty years. You're pretty mm -hmm. well entrenched in your job, and you know what you're doing, of course. But you're dealing with, like you said, a whole bunch of prima donnas. 
who are getting paid an enormous amounts of oh. money, even the youngest one or the youngest or the, even the lowest paid ones are ridiculous. But here's my question. In that training room, that's your domain. They need you way more than you need them. How much of your personality do you allow to come out to kind of set some of these guys in place? Or is there not that protocol and you, you really can't say what you really feel like you should say to some of these? Guys? No, I, I think you have to do it diplomatically. You know, I think uh, the success uh, that the Steelers have had or our training room has had is number one, we have outstanding people that work there. And by that, I mean, uh, there are, every single one is a Tim Brame or a, a Paul Federici. Uh, they're all, and I, we were the first team in the NFL to hire a female athletic trainer. We hired a Rico Iso back in, I don't know, 98 or 2000 or something like that, but we were the first team to hire a female athletic trainer. So. I think when I talk to the players, I tell them, I said, some of you are going to like me. Uh, some of you, uh, Davion Lee is one of my assistants. Somebody's going to like John Andino or somebody might like Sonia Roof. I said, I don't care who you develop a relationship with, but we got to help you and you got to help us and be completely honest when you have issues so that we have the opportunity to provide the best possible medical care we can for you. Because it's, it's not only a benefit to you. Yeah, we'll try to get you back on the field and prolong your career and have the opportunity to succeed. But the ultimate goal, you know, is not for you to matriculate from, from uh, Pittsburgh Steeler University. It's to help the Steelers win the Super Bowl. That's our goal. You know, we, we, we talk about uh, we're trying to win a championship here all the time. And that's the truth. That's what you're trying to do in the NFL. You're trying to win. And um, – I think there's only been in 30, this will be my 31st season. I bet there's less than six losing seasons we've had in Pittsburgh. No. I, and I'm, I, that six might be an over, overreach. It might be four. But there aren't many that where we either weren't eight and eight or above. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it, of course, the scoreboard tells it each game and each season. But what you do behind the scenes and for that little bit, when we see the Norwig shuffle off the sidelines onto the field, and I'm going to come back to the Norwig shuffle in just a second, what your job is such an important component that a lot of people, they don't take that into consideration. It's really an unsung part of the equation. And I know you're not looking for praise, but that's just the reality of what you have accomplished and what you've been able to do all these years. But John, Here's, <laughs> I got to go back to this. This is a Jeff Mays. You remember Jeff Mays, wide receiver from Florida. He created, came up with the Norwig or the Wig shuffle because of the way you used to run. I don't know. Uh, if, I don't know if you ran with Coach Bates or some of the other uh, athletes or, or trainers, but you had a little shuffle about it. And people can still see that shuffle in all seriousness when you're going on and off the field. And I just think it's great. And Fred Peterson, they mentioned it. So I wanted to bring that up. If you were aware of the wig shuffle. Well, I know that I bounce and I, I, I move differently. I'm stiff. But just remember, you know, I could beat Bates in the marathon. We ran a number of marathons. Well, I was going to ask that. Yeah. And I could always kick Bates' ass. So I used to enjoy that. <laughs> 26 <laughs> miles, but that big muscle stiff could get beat by me. And we See? they ran fast. Here, 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 now we're getting to some Norwigs. Uh, the Norwig, the, 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 the memories and some of your personality from back in the day that everybody so in, enjoyed, equally fearful as well as respected. Scott Penny out of Florida is with us this evening. Mm -hmm. Hey, Scott, thank you for joining us. Let me see who else has rolled in. Coach Shepard said, he, I, think, I guess he's got to go back to washing dishes. Said, it's great to see you. And uh, Noel Wells, of course. Well, guys, of course, I'm talking with John Norwig. We've got a few more minutes before we, we let him out of here. John, what, I guess, every, I don't know how often, maybe it's yearly, maybe it's every other year, but it seems that sports medicine seems to evolve continually. And this is just my outsider, uh, untrained uh, observation, but surgeries that took place in the 80s and it would take six months to a year. Now they're back playing within weeks. And I guess here, here's my question to you. 
And, and that can be a scary thing for an athlete as well as an exciting thing, knowing, hey, when the doctor says, we, we're going to get you back out, you know, in this per, per period of time where in the past it was forever. I guess what, I don't know really how to ask this, but from your perspective, from your position and working with those physicians and trying to get your athletes back ready for, for action is they want to push. I guess the athlete typically wants to push to get back out there, but how do you keep from a protocol standpoint, letting the athlete know, I know you want to be out there, but if you go out there too soon, then you're risking your, your in further injury and, and the like. Where, where do, how do you deal with that? Well, I think that's a delicate balance, Bernard. I think that um, number one is, is that you have an opportunity uh, as an athletic trainer. To, my, I was educated. I, I took anatomy. I took uh, evaluation. We talked about prevention. Uh, we talked about rehab, all those things. But uh, an athletic trainer is married to a, a good physician. If you have a good orthopedic surgeon, it helps you quite a bit. And someone that I think it's important for me and for every athletic trainer that you, you continually uh, try to improve yourself and, and you have to change. So with that said, reaching back to Vanderbilt, um, going back to Penn State, uh, we had a good group of docs there. And I, I, they, they were good to me. They, they mentored me. And when I came to uh, Vanderbilt, and I know he was eccentric, but I, but I can tell you that, that Pinky Lipscomb, Brant Lipscomb was, it was, Vanderbilt was so important to him. And, and he, he, you know, on the outside, sometimes the players didn't respect him as much, but I knew how much he learned it. And, you know, he was an All-American there. He was an All-American in basketball. He was an All-American in baseball. And he, he wanted that, that school to do well. He loved that school. But he, he mentored me. And I, I learned a lot of things from Dr. Lipscomb. And some of the things he did were a little antiquated, but the thing that was most important is I knew that he, he continually learned and his heart was in the right place. He wanted to take care of, care of you guys. And then his partner, um, Bob Snyder, he, he was uh, his right-hand man. He, he was the same way and he would mentor Fed and, and uh, uh, Tim and myself. And I had the utmost respect for him. And the same thing happened here in Pittsburgh where we, when I came to Pittsburgh, uh, we had a, a physician that um, uh, I didn't think was of the same quality that I was exposed to in, at, at Penn State and at, at Vanderbilt. And I told, uh, you know, I was young, I was 28 or I was 34, I think, when I went to the Steelers. And I, I told him, I said, these guys aren't as good as what I was exposed to at my colleges. And we got a good physician in here and he's been with me for 30 years now, but he, he too uh, understands athletes and has been really good to the training staff. He's educated all of us. So uh, a long way around saying that just like your job changes, I'm sure that uh, things have happened in law that, that have changed and you get better at, at things. The same thing happens in sports medicine where we understand concussions more. My God, what we did for concussions uh, at Vanderbilt is antiquated compared to what we do today. My God, the way, you know, we, there's things called high ankle sprains and you hear uh, them talk about that on Sports Center. And uh, we didn't know what the hell a high ankle sprain was in uh, 1984 when I was at, 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 or 1986 or whatever, when I was at Vanderbilt. I, we really didn't, we thought it was an ankle sprain and should be treated similarly. Well, now we understand the anatomy better. We understand, you know, what happens to that ankle. You know, uh, obviously things like the ACL and, and I don't know, those, some people on here may still have that pinky muscle in their leg because he was using the IT band, or, which none of you guys know about, but it, it, he was using that to reconstruct the knee because he was brave enough to go in and, and reconstruct ACLs. And, and at that time, in the 80s, not many people were reconstructing ACL. So Dr. Lipscomb was on the cusp. And what they do today when someone tears an ACL, you're from Birmingham, right? Well, Jeremy Andrews was, was big not only with uh, the knee, but he was big with the shoulder and that type of thing. So Dr. Andrews was on the forefront. Uh, believe it or not, Pinky Lipscomb was. There was a guy at Auburn by the name of Jack Houston, who was a, a big time 
uh, position in the Southeastern Conference when I was there. But all these guys, uh, you know, they they share their knowledge, and uh, we all learn things. We know more about anatomy than we did, gosh, back in the '80s. But um, and the rehab techniques of, of how hard we can push somebody. But you know, uh, and that that's a that's a big deal. Uh, I hope at Vanderbilt, but and I, I hope I learned it from Vanderbilt and Penn State is that you involve your athlete when they do have a significant injury so they understand and they understand about the healing process and how long it takes and what steps you have to go through in order to return. But uh, I, I, I hope that our athletic training staff at Vanderbilt did that to you guys, and I hope we continue to do that with the Pittsburgh Steelers today. I think that's what we do uh, while trying to maintain a good relationship with players and, and uh, agents and parents and scouts and uh, coaches or every, it's all part of that. And, uh, you know, you have to have a strength and conditioning coach that understands too, because sometimes, you know, if you have somebody that's a muscle head and they push somebody too much, they're going to hurt them as well. So, uh, I know I've answered this. I'm long winded about that question, but things have changed so much. And we were so, when you guys played, it was so much different because the knowledge base was so much smaller. But I, but I also think that you and your teachings and your ways, and your staff, as well as Brad Bates's ways and his staff, I think you guys were pretty cutting edge at the time because you, you mentioned, we, we talked about the St. Valentine's Day massacre and all the craziness that Coach Bates used to do. That wasn't just straight getting in there and doing bench and, and the traditional weights. He was having us do all different types of things with the goal of still getting us bigger, faster, and stronger. And I suspect that you getting us in and out of the training staff, uh, training room as quickly as, as, as practical uh, was also with the same goals in mind. Cause you guys were, were pretty, I think ahead of the game or at least on the curve at the time. Well, what Brad did is Brad got you guys functionally strong. He didn't worry about putting something on the wall that said uh, Bernard Nomberg leads uh, the Vanderbilt Commodores because he can bench 525 pounds three times. And, you know, there are still schools that we get players from that, that model their programs after how much you can squat, how much you can, can uh, deadlift, how much can you bench, how much can you military press. And those athletes come to us and they get hurt because the body has its limits. You don't need to lift 700 pounds to play football it's good it's good to be strong mm -hmm. but it's far better for you to be an efficient athlete because you, if you are efficient quick uh, uh athlete you have good hands you have good feet you can do more than the, a guy that can bench 750 pounds you just can't yeah look at the evolution of the different positions within the nfl the the linebackers linemen all of these positions i think is what you're describing is you don't have to be that big lumbering huge guy in fact you're not going to make it if you don't have those agilities that the current athlete is is coming out of college with but in any way i i appreciate all of your your insight about that john i want to welcome dr joel walker says to tell you hello joel's a physician in uh Fort Worth, Dallas area, Arlington, I believe. Joel, thank you for stopping by. Uh, Fred says that Andy Mack had one of those head ringers and probably are oh. back then. Yep. Andy, Andy McCarroll. McCarroll. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's, that was a, <laughs> Andy McCarroll's a great guy and so is his brother, Mack. They, they are great memories. What, what wonderful people they were, but uh Mac, no, no defense. If Mac's on this, no uh, offense to you, but your brother was a hell of an athlete. Your brother was, uh, and when he had that concussion, he had it multiple times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope he's not having any issues from it now. But we've learned, I learned from him, and uh, we didn't understand it as well as we do today. But he had, yep, I remember the year, I think Andy was a, a junior that year. 
he, Andy and Fred and myself were all in that first Watson Brown signing class in the fall. Mac of, was already here when yeah, he came. Mac, Mac was two years ahead of us, I believe. Yeah. Mac was with Coach Mac's classes. Uh, John, before I let you get, get, get out of here, kind of share with us a little bit while we're talking about concussions and, and head uh, trauma, what's the current recognized protocol for, for a, a concussion or whatever the proper term is? Because I know that they have in the college game and in the pro game, they've evolved penalties and they're teaching different techniques of, mm. of how to properly hit. But what's the current, I guess, what's the current NFL protocol for that? Well, you know, a concussion or mild traumatic brain injury, if you want to be, try to try to uh, look intelligent, is, um, you know, to keep, to dummy it down, is the brain is no different than in a, it gets injured, much like you go on the turf at Vanderbilt and you tear up your elbow because you scrape it, you get a turf burn on your elbow. But if I don't give that turf burn the time to heal and I go out and uh, I keep scraping it on that AstroTurf without protecting it, it's not going to heal. In fact, if I scrape it on that AstroTurf and somebody spit there, I may get a, some type of infection in my elbow because I don't allow it to heal. Mm -hmm. Well, I, the brain today is if, if we recognize anything, I mean, the NFL, uh, we have uh, an unaffiliated neurosurgeon on our sideline to help us with concussions. We have people that are athletic trainers in the uh, press box. I think they do that in the SEC now. There's another physician in that box. Um, and if we, you know, if we have anything where we suspect someone uh, has been concussed and an official can tell you they're concussed or are acting funny, a, a teammate can tell you that they're acting funny. Um, one of us, one of our physicians, somebody from the box, or so many people that watch videos um, and uh, anyone that doesn't takes a big hit or uh, wobbles or, or something like that, they're going to get evaluated on the sideline. And we have a certain concussion protocol that we follow in the, the sidelines. And it's, it's uh, that unaffiliated neurosurgeon with the Steelers. We have a neurosurgeon in that uh, tent, we have an internal medicine doc. And uh, after we go through a regimen of questions and, and we review the video on the sidelines, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but in the last 10 years, we've had the opportunity to look at a couple different feeds that they use on television so that we can review not only uh, mild traumatic brain injuries, but we also look at orthopedic injuries because mechanism of injury, the way an injury occurs plays a role into what type of injury you're dealing with. But anyhow, back to concussions. So if we suspect a concussion from that tent, they go inside. And then there's uh, something called the SCAD-5, which is an international um, uh, screening tool that's been agreed upon by all the uh, experts throughout the world. It's used worldwide, but we do that in the uh, locker room. It's all uh, on an iPad so that we collect that data. The NFL can look at that data. Um, but very, we, we handle concussions completely differently. And then the recovery period is such where we use uh, a tool called uh, IMPACT, which is neurocognitive testing that's done on a computer. Uh, it's been millions and millions of uh, tests have been done. So it's a valid and reliable instrument. Uh, there are different testing that we do when they return, they have to see three physicians before they can return. Very few guys can get back in a week. So it, it's a very mild concussion if a guy gets hurt on Sunday and, and can play again the following uh, Sunday. So there's a lot more uh, emphasis placed on that. And Alan Sills at Vanderbilt, you know, he's the uh, medical director for the NFL. He's a neurosurgeon that was working with the uh, Vanderbilt Commodore football team, which, who's now the medical director for the NFL. Very good. Well, John, I, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us to share a little bit of your journey, your time at Vanderbilt, Penn State, and for so many years in the NFL with the Steelers. So thank you for making some time for us tonight. Oh, you're welcome. I, I'm flattered to be asked, Bernard. I'm sorry I couldn't get on during the season. 
<laughs> it's, it's quite all right. <laughs> it's okay. I'm, I'm just so thrilled that I know you're on vacation right now and made, made a little time for us. But no, John, I'm at work now. I was on vacation last week, Bernard. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Well, John, thank you again. And for all, all these awesome comments and folks rolling through from back in your, your day at, at Vanderbilt, again, each week is, is conversations with Commodores. And I hope you guys keep coming back and anchor down. Take care. Anchor down.